and physical oceanographer. And my research has been focused on the biophysical interaction. And my research usually through numeric modeling in combination with observations. So today, I'm going to talk about my favorite topic, but physical constraints I find phytoplankton production. So to be clear what I'm talking about, uh, the phytoplankton is a microscopic plant-like cells that live in the marine environments. So they look like this individually, but this is the reality usually they, forge, they form large patches in the open water. So this animation shows you the monthly evolution of glo global chlorophyll climatology. Um, here, there are several information we can take. So looking at a spatial pattern, so the bright green color are high chlorophyll concentration, while the blue color shows low chlorophyll. So it's clear that we already have high chlorophyll concentration along the margins of the major basin because higher nutrients level and also along equator where the upwelling occurs. But we also have this low nutrient, no, low chlorophyll region in the center of major gyre due to low nutrient level. And also we have low chlorophyll in the southern ocean due to air limitation. And if we fix location, looking at time, temporal evolution of the animation, we'll see that the phytoplankton production usually evolves with a light availability over the seasonal cycle. So because fine phytoplankton production forms the base um, of the trophic levels, so energy flow into this level will further affect <coughs> ecosystem productivity, uh, community structure, and fisheries. So the phytoplankton production actually are controlled by physics in three dimensions. So along the vertical dimension um, because the living resources and the grazing pressure are not uniform over the depth, so which means we have nutrients that go in increases with depth, but our light decreases with depth. So based on that, the phytoplankton growth actually based on the trade-off between the light and nutrients. And if we also consider the grazing pressure over the signal cycle, there are more complex dynamics in here. So um, there's still open debate on why the phytoplankton production occurs seasonally in the ocean. So I list the several of them here. So Sewardroof hypothesis highlights the signal evolution of the mixer depths. So basically, there is a phytoplankton growth and the phytoplankton <coughs> loss term. Uh, over the signal cycle, the imbalance between the two actually create the bloom we have seen in the ocean. So Thurdrup's hypothesis said that um, during the shallowing of the mixer depths, actually the, the increase of the production rate within very intense layer that the, in the growth rate far exceeds the loss rate so that we will see aggregation of phytoplankton in the upper water column. So disturbance of carry hypothesis disagrees with Thurdrup. Instead, they're thinking like phytoplankton bloom actually occurs during the deepening phase of the mixed layer because the dilution effect actually dilute the grazing faster than the growth. Critical mixing hypothesis is kind of a um, sitting between the two because they believe that it's the active mixing instead of the mixed layer depths that affect the deepening and shallowing of the growing layer. So horizontally, there are other also additional physical processes that may constraints of phytoplankton production. So generally speaking, the horizontal transport in the ocean is much faster than the time needed for phytoplankton to grow. So that's why I'm showing this uh, satellite image, which I like best because it incorporates so many processes in here. For example, we can see this idyllic swirls in the ocean that has high concentration of chlorophyll in the middle, which indicates the growth. And also we have this fronts and as all the jets that highlights where the phytoplankton could grow. And also the upwelling processes, which is a horizontal plus vertical processes that usually enhance during the coastal region. And what didn't show in this figure is the current related connectivity. So that usually related to organisms that have a complex life cycle that ha has life traits interact with the physical processes over the transport processes. 
So why do we care about physical constraints at phytoplankton? So I, I hope with the first two slides, I already showed you why physical processes can control the spatial and temporal patterns of phytoplankton production. In addition to that, um, we were now facing that numerical model uncertainties and cross-model discrepancy. So the uncertainty arises from the parameter we use in the model that does not fully represent the reality. And also the cross-model discrepancy <coughs> arises from different model equations, different dynamics incorporated in the model. So those coming from the physical constraints, for example, in this case, can cause the different results or answers we ask in the model. So for example, the stratification within all the 20 climate modelers within the study that are used for IPCC report have shown different ocean stratification in present decades. Um, and also looking into the future, they become diverge, become a big envelope that's surrounded as the uncertainties we can use for future prediction. And also this uncertainty within the physics can lead up to the uncertainty in the biology. So it's, it seems that they converge some, to some degree in the present uh, handcast, but in the forecast, seems the biology is very sensitive to subtle differences in physics. And also the physical constraints, as you can see here, into the future, it inf influences the projection uh, trajectory of the future climate. Um, directly, they're influencing the biophysical interaction, and indirectly, they influence the carbon <coughs> pump and also the, the carbon cycle within the Earth. So today, um, I'm going to walk with you about two case studies to show and to demonstrate how different types of physical processes that constrain the phytoplankton production in the ocean. So one case in the Antarctic Polynesia, and the other case is in the West the Flower Shelf. So those studies are carried recently after I arrived um, arrive at USF. And um, because today's talk is not, main purpose is not delivers a science. So unlike the talk I gave before that showing you a lot of results today, I would like to show you what behind the proposing processes. So how we identify those physical constraints, how we use preliminary observation to um, prove they exist and resolve the connection, and what kind of um, further study we propose on that topic. So I'm going to work with you on the two cases about those two key points. So the first one is about Antarctic Polynesia. <clears throat> so before that, I would like to give several facts about the Polynesia. So this is our visible image from the satellite, which you can see that there's a clear sea ice cover in, in white, and the black color is a hole in the middle of the sea ice. So those are called the Polynesia because they remain open water area over the winter time, even in the polar region. So those, this is Polynesia is what uh, I think Amelia talked a moment ago. It's uh, in the Man Sea. So this, this Polynesia is as big as um, the area of South Carolina. So they're not trivial. They're a large area of open water. And we have about like 40 to 50 Polynesias around the Antarctic coast around the coastal lines. So they vary in size and latitude. For example, we have Polynesia on the eastern side relatively lay in the higher latitude, but the Polynesia on the western side relatively in the low latitude. And also we have major Polynesia like Rose Sea Polynesia we mentioned a moment ago is um, much larger than the other. And we also have this tiny Polynesia um, in the eastern side, a lot of them very small. So those planiers are marked by um, biological, marked as biological hotspot because they usually have very intense summer production. So our preliminary study back to 2005 quantitatively assessed the primary production in those tiny small system around the coast, surprisingly. So the primary production within those regions even though their area is small, but they play a very disproportionately large role in the total production in the South Ocean. So they take about like 30% of primary production. And also, back to higher traffic level, we have penguin colonies around the Antarctica. And to date, so far, all the penguin colonies identified in situ and from satellite usually associated one or two 
coastal plainias as their foraging area. So those plainias are very important to Antarctic higher trophic level predators. Um, despite their, this importance, unfortunately, so far those plainias are largely missing or underrepresented in all climate models used for IPCC. The reason is first because their resolution in the course cannot resolve polynia, and also the dynamics within polynia are quite different from the open ocean. That's why it's worth for separate study to understand what's really controlled the primary production here. So based on polynia physics, uh, the polynia can be um, defined within the spectrum. I'm showing you two extreme cases in here, while real polynia actually is a lot of like combination of both. So in the type 1 polynia, it's, it's driven by the oceanic process, which the warm in, wa salty water intrusion arises to the surface and start to melt the ice, sea ice near the surface, cause opening within the middle of sea ice flow. So if we have a warm water intrusion and rising to the surface, this, this will usually detect um, as uh, during win winter time, there's uh, additional heat sources. That's why we see opening near surface. The other type of pollinia is driven by atmospheric process, not the ocean. So ocean actually responds to the atmosphere meteorological forcing. So those pollinia usually locate close to um, very, very high elevated area. Usually like East Antarctica, we have very thick ice sheets, about like 1,000 meters high. So those carnabatic winds going down the slope and can accelerate to very high speed, as strong as more than 100 miles per hour for weeks. So this, this speed is usually much higher than the hurricane attacked Hawaii days ago. So it's, you can kind of thinking of stretch, stretch that event over a weekly or monthly window, see how powerful those winds can affect the ocean. So when this dry and cold air blow through the ocean, they create, um, they create a very intense interaction. So they absorb heat from the ocean and also create a lot of ice from that region. So those ice formation um, cause the brown water injection and then the dense water sink to the bottom, cause the dense water moving away from the shelf. That's what you already talk about, the deep water formation. That's a hot topic um, in recent Earth studies that we believe those location, a hot spot of where the deep water originated. So also the wind blow ice away quickly from the coast to create an opening um, to form the plania. So climatic winds plus warm water intrusion are usually two um, dynamics that form different types of plania. But what is actual dynamic processes within those plania are quite different. So within this one, because it's a heat induce the polynia, so it's usually have a shallow mixed layer, and the mixing is weak and shallow. Well, this, this kind of polynia is caused by deep convection. So the deep convection actually can bring up very strong mixing, as deep as like 1,000 meters, which is very unfavorable for phytoplankton growth. And also, considering biological effects, the air injection from the two types are different. So those polynia usually involves basal melting and also sea ice melting. So the two factors bring additional iron salts into the polynia that can cause enhance the primary production immediately after sea ice retreat. Well, this, this type of polynia, because of lack of iron injection, uh, usually very poor in iron. And also, if we consider primary production, <coughs> usually we will see very intense bloom in this type of polynia and bloom a, little, a lot weaker in this type of polynia. So if we believe that the Antarctic coast, coast of polynia are heterogeneous, they are different in physics, different in pr primary productivity, there must be a way to quantify it even using very limited data. So based on the characteristic of the two types of polynia, we believe the CS production, which we can observe from the satellite, and also the phytoplankton production we can infer from the ocean color, can provide us the first step evidence to look into the problem. So in this study, we, um, we <coughs> use satellite CS concentrations that has ocean color combined with the CS production to understand whether we can quantify the different types of polynia around Antarctica so that we can tar target for specific polynia for detailed dynamics. 
So in here, I showed you the spatial variability of the 50 planets um, we detected. So I arranged them purposely from high latitude to lower latitude, which gives you an impression how the uh, phytoplankton initiation day of the year, which is a proxy, very sensitive proxy of climate change, that vary over the space. So it, we, we did not see a clear pattern that this day changed with latitude, which means those days does not really track the, the progression of solar irradiance into the area. Instead, we calculated the S adjusted light onset day, which means we consider ice retreat from that location and when the light force available to those planea. And we see very similar in interplanear variability as shown in the bloom initiation day. So the, this as a first step evidence indicate indeed the CI dynamics and the work column dynamics can cause a difference in, in biology between different planeas. And looking into each planar, because we have 16-year data that we can see the variability of the timing over this time period. So for example, in this planar, the black color is a sea ice retreat date, and the red color is a phytoplankton initiation date. It's clear that at the beginning of this period, the two are decoupled, like two months away from each other. Well, into the recent years, they are very close. They track each other which means the dynamics might shift from the beginning toward the recent years. And also in another planar we highlight in our proposal, this is where we have rich penguin data, meteorological data to quantify each of the processes. So this planar shows a similar thing. At the beginning, it's like wiggling around. The two are apart from each other, but into recent years, they're more close. So if we propose that all the planars, they're not even, they're not uniform, there must be a quantitative step toward that to show people. Um, indeed, there is the underlying physics control those heterogeneity. So back to the previous slides, if you still remember, there is a key characteristic of the different planars. For example, like the CS production, type, type 2 is much higher than type 1. But just due to this characteristic, it creates unfavorable conditions for phytoplankton production. So in this case, if we use this two as axis, so horizontal is a CS production, vertical is a synchronicity, which is a biological indicator. So we should see a negative relationship between the two. So this quantitative study provides the first step that we see this about 22 variability of the bio biological. Uh, response can be explained by the CS production among so many factors. So which means the, the physical processes actually pro pro play as a leading role in control of the spatial variability of the planar. So to understand this in details, we propose to an SF polar program about this idea to integrate um, CIS expert and phytoplankton biologist and also the penguin expert to look into this interdisciplinary issue. So we believe the different planar can cause different ice formation, dense water formation, and also can cause different pr primary production. Into also, um, penguin population and dynamics. So in this proposal, uh, my role is to develop this biological MPZD type of model to understand whether the observed variability in light, sea ice, wind, and other forcing factors can introduce the, exactly the dynamics we propose into this system. And this part has been done previously in back to 2003, but there's no dynamic comparison across planar. And something new to this proposal is we also bring in the newly developed idea on iron cycling um, from basal melting and the sea ice. So this project that started, and hopefully next year I'm going to provide you a very exciting result to show the difference between planars. So the case two is about the right tide in, on the Florida shelf. And for those of you who are not familiar with the right tide, I recently learned this um, by myself too. So those are, those are dinoflagellates that vary like 20 to 40 micrometers in diameter. And observation has shown, and also um, lab experiments show us, they have this vertical swimming speed, like two meters per hour in the field, 
which means they migrate vertically and are against the vertical motion of the water. And also, they have positive phototaxis at low nutrient stress. So which means that when nutrient is rich, they flow upward, they, they swim upward to take advantage of light. But when nutrient is poor, they dive into the bottom to stay away from light. So there's a 0 0.2 to 1 division speed per day. And I, this number is meaningful later on, I will tell you momentarily. And also, they produce harmful brevin toxin um, to, that harmful to marine life and human. So that's the, what occurred recently, if you um, read in the news and know that the state, or, state of emergency on the red tide along the west of Florida Shelf. This is a species majorly that caused this detrimental event. And also, in na natural condition, background condition, you're like, like land, less than 10 cells per liter. But when they grow intensely, so a bloom condition, they can go to 10 to 5 cells per liter within a very short time period. So taking those characteristics of the uh, Karenia's traits, so let's go back to the physics, see how, why they thrive in vessel from their shelf, and what indeed the detailed processes that uh, relate to their bloom. So previous study already established the statistical link between physics and the biology. So this includes where um, our own Bob Weisberg 2016 and the related publication show that this coastal upwelling into the shelf from the deep ocean into the shelf bring high nutrients um, that favors the uh, growth of this bursting species in the oligotrophic zone. And also, later on, there's study still by Weisberg showing that there is a possible origin and pathway for the um, Carinthia seeds transported from offshore to the coastal region along the west of the Florida Shelf. And also, there's later on recent um, study showing that not only the shelf processes, but also the loop current penetration into the Gulf create offshore conditions that could be favorable for the later bloom in the coastal region. So those two pieces together told us that we have to consider two pieces of physical information. One is the physical information offshore, and one is the physical information inshore. And they are different in phase. One is ahead of another to